Hello and welcome to this video in which we'll be covering a case of acute liver failure in the context of a patient who has taken a paracetamol overdose. My name is Ross McKean and I'm one of the clinical teaching fellows who has been teaching on the GI module this year. The purpose of this short video is to provide you with the knowledge of how to investigate and manage a patient who presents having taken an overdose of paracetamol hopefully providing you with some light relief from the more didactic and theoretical learning you might be more used to. To get the most out of this video, I would strongly recommend you watch it in a group or at least in pairs, otherwise have a pen and paper to hand, as there will be many points throughout this video in which I'll get you to pause it and discuss questions I'll be asking you. So let's go to the admissions ward, where you as the FY1 doctor have been asked to clerk this young woman in. As the doctor takes the history here, I want you to write down the important points as if you were writing in the patient's notes. Hi doctor. Hello sir, sorry for the delay in coming to see you. Very busy today. Yeah, well, I guess it can't be helped. So is this Gemma? Aye. Sorry, and you are? Jimmy. I'm her boyfriend. Thanks. Gemma, hello. Can you hear me, Gemma? Oh, hi. Oh, sorry, I'm shattered. Oh, what am I doing here? Well, that's hopefully what I'm going to find out from you. <laughs> Can you tell me what's been going on today? Well, how the hell should I know? Jimmy, you know why you're here. You took all that bloody paracetamol, didn't you? Did I? <laughs> Can I even remember? I'm completely pissed. Look what I could do with a drink right now, actually. Got the start of a splitting headache. Can't do that, I'm afraid. Um, how are you feeling apart from that headache? I got some tummy pains, I guess. Okay, can you, can you tell me a little bit more about that? It's just all over, really. A bit worse up here. When did that start? <sighs> Only just noticed it. Is anything making it better or worse? Don't know. Right. Uh, any other problems? I feel like I'm gonna book. Have you been sick at all already? No. I don't think so. Okay, so you took paracetamol. Any idea how much? No idea. Doc, when I went round to a flat, I saw an empty box of paracetamol and a half-empty bottle of vodka. Ah, thanks, Jimmy. That's useful to know. Was it just a box of paracetamol from the supermarket? Aye, Sainsbury's. So you've been drinking a bit then, Gemma? Just a bit. How much do you normally drink, say, in a week? Not much. I go through about two bottles of vodka a week. Right. Do you know why you take the paracetamol? I got a text from her saying she was going to take it after we'd been arguing over the phone. Any idea when that was? Must have been about six o'clock this evening. From that short clip, you'll have noticed the doctor asked open-ended questions at the start before asking more specific questions. The important points to glean from that history are how much paracetamol had been taken, at what time it was taken, the reason behind taking the overdose, was it impulsive or well thought out with suicidal intent? You'll want to ask if there were any other tablets taken alongside the overdose, a uh, mixed overdose. And you'll want to ask questions to elicit whether the patient has features suggestive of acute liver failure. For example, you might pick up from the history that the patient is drowsy and confused. This might make you concerned about hepatic encephalopathy. They might also complain of easy bruising related to deranged clotting and abdominal distension related to the development of ascites. Okay, so the doctor takes the rest of the history. The important points here are that there is a past medical history of depression. You'd also want to ask here if this is associated with self-harm and ask if there are any previous history of overdoses. Gemma tells you that the only medication she takes is the combined oral contraceptive pill. She was put on fluoxetine by her GP half a year ago, but she didn't feel they did her any good. From the clip, we found out that Gemma is also a heavy drinker, despite her thinking otherwise. 
drinking in excess of 60 units a week. She also smokes. Now, pause the video in a second. If Gemma was to be an acute liver failure, what findings do you think you might see on physical examination? Okay, so if Gemma had acute liver failure, one of the first things that might be immediately obvious on physical examination is that she would be jaundiced. You might also notice bruising. Asking her then to extend her hands out might reveal asterixis, or hepatic flap, a sign of hepatic encephalopathy that arises as a result of neurotoxins passing into the brain. If the hepatic encephalopathy is severe enough, the intracranial pressure can rise and so papilledema may be seen on fundoscopy, along with hypertension and bradycardia as part of Cushing's reflex. The patient might be tachypneic as well, as the patient will have a metabolic acidosis as a result of the paracetamol overdose that is trying to be compensated for by blowing off carbon dioxide. There might be the presence of ascites elicited through checking for shifting dullness, as well as edema occurring secondary to hypoalbuminemia. Fortunately, what we can see on physical examination of Gemma is that there are no features of acute liver failure as she has presented early. There is little to note, in fact, apart from some mild tenderness on palpation of the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. That's an important point to remember, actually. Little may be obvious from the history and physical examination if the patient has taken an overdose, apart from fairly non-specific symptoms. In cases where the history is not so clear-cut, it's important to have a high index of suspicion and check a patient's paracetamol levels, especially when there's an unexplained metabolic acidosis. For example, imagine this was a frail elderly woman who is taking paracetamol regularly, one gram four times a day from her blister pack, and also as required, not realising that's too much. And this would be a so-called unintentional staggered overdose. Or a patient that has presented confused and there is no one who witnessed the overdose. In these cases, paracetamol overdose might not be immediately obvious. So yes, in the early stages, there are non-specific symptoms. It's only normally after around 24 hours that the overdose has caused sufficient damage for the patient to go on to have acute liver failure and so the symptoms and signs associated with that. Right, so again, pause the video. Based on what you know, what is your differential diagnosis and what is your management plan going to be for Gemma? Okay, so this is not the hardest question to answer, is it? Obviously, the diagnosis is of paracetamol overdose, but if we wanted to extend that out a bit, we could say that this was an impulsive paracetamol overdose with no features of acute liver failure. There are a few other differentials we should also consider, however. So Gemma complains of upper abdominal pain and she's consumed a lot of alcohol, so she could quite reasonably have alcoholic gastritis, even pancreatitis, although the pain you'd expect to be much more severe. Also in your differential, and certainly something you must exclude, is whether Gemma is pregnant. You have to think about this possibility in any childbearing sexually active woman who presents with abdominal pain and nausea, regardless of whether they're on the pill or not. I'll let you pause the video again if any of the differentials discussed here make you want to alter your management plan. Okay, so what are you going to do? Well, when faced with managing any patient, remember you can't go wrong with an ABCDE approach. There is nothing wrong with Gemma's airway or breathing. If Gemma was dyspneic, however, because of the metabolic acidosis and a Kussmaul respiration in an attempt to compensate for that, we might consider a chest x-ray and certainly getting an ABG, an arterial blood gas or a venous blood gas to assess for any acid-base disturbance, where we'd likely see a metabolic acidosis with a raised anion gap. And it's doubly useful because a lower pH is the most important prognostic indicator in acute liver failure and highlights the need to strongly consider liver transplantation. When you get to C, circulation, this will prompt you to do some blood tests. So what blood tests should we get? 
Well, we would request a full blood count, looking mainly for any evidence of an increase in the white cell count or a fall in the platelet count known as thrombocytopenia, which may be seen in acute liver failure. We'll request eusinase. Are there any electrolyte abnormalities we need to correct? Heavy drinkers are at risk of electrolyte disturbances such as hyponatremia, hypokalemia and hypomagnesia. The urea and creatinine will also be useful to look at. Renal dysfunction is an important prognostic indicator as well in acute liver failure and is a common complication termed hepatorenal syndrome. Bicarbonate level represented on the computer as their TCO2. A lowered bicarb level indicates the patient has a metabolic acidosis. We'll request LFTs, where we might see a marked rise in the transaminases, the hepatic liver enzymes ALT and AST. A useful way to remember these intrahepatic enzymes is that they give you a salty taste, these two words containing the enzyme names within them. ALP and GGT are extrahepatic that would normally rise in the context of problems such as gallstones impacting in the common bile duct. GGT is a more mixed enzyme though, and is often raised if the patient has been drinking alcohol. We'll request a coagulation screen to elicit whether any liver damage has caused an increase in the prothrombin time and INR, again a useful prognostic marker. We'll request an analyse to check for pancreatitis. We'll check a random blood glucose, taking an initial capillary blood glucose reading too, to ensure Gemma isn't hypoglycemic, which could be as a result of her heavy alcohol intake, but can also be seen in hepatic necrosis because of an impaired ability to mobilise glycogen stores in the liver. And so in this case, the hypoglycemia might be very resistant to treatment. Most importantly, in terms of treating Gemma's paracetamol overdose, we'll request a paracetamol level. Doing so will guide Gemma's management. Of note, paracetamol levels are only accurate after four hours of ingestion or more. So there's no point taking a paracetamol level before this time. We might also request salicylate levels as well, a rise suggesting an overdose of aspirin. Ethanol levels are not really worth checking in this case, as we know this is probably going to be raised and it isn't going to alter our management plan. Okay, so D, disability. Here again, that's not an issue, but if Gemma did have hepatic encephalopathy as part of her presentation, we should consider the use of laxatives and enemas to decrease the nitrogen mode from the gut. And then on to E for everything else. So remember to take a capillary blood glucose reading here if you haven't done so already. And then we'll think about other points related to the management specifically of this case. We'll want to control Gemma's symptoms. She's complained of abdominal pain and nausea. So we'll provide analgesia, obviously not paracetamol, and an antiemetic. We'll request a urine sample so we can send it for beta-HCG, the pregnancy test. And you might consider a urine toxicology screen if the history was less clear. Given that Gemma has a background of heavy alcohol consumption, we'll prescribe Papernix and Diazepam. The most important point though in treating Gemma will be giving her N-acetylcysteine, the antidote to the paracetamol poisoning initiated when we know her paracetamol level and seeing that it's above the treatment line on the paracetamol nomogram. A psychiatry assessment will be worth considering too, though the indication for this here is not that strong given the nature of the overdose. It normally would form a vital part of the management plan for those who take paracetamol with suicidal intent who have not regretted their actions. Right, let's talk about N-acetylcysteine, or NAC. Why do we give this medication? In order to understand this, it is worth spending a short minute looking at the metabolism of paracetamol. Normally, when paracetamol is metabolised in the liver, it is made water-soluble following conjugation and then excreted by the kidneys. However, in the context of an overdose, this process becomes saturated, such that it is metabolised through an alternative pathway, the cytochrome P450 system, producing the toxic product N-acetyl-P-benzoquinonamine. 
Fortunately, this is normally rapidly broken down into non-toxic conjugates by glutathione, preventing any damage. Damage occurs when stores of glutathione then becomes deplete, allowing a buildup of this toxic metabolite and an ensuing process of oxidative damage and mitochondrial dysfunction. N-acetylcysteine is the precursor of glutathione and so replenishes the glutathione stores, thus allowing the toxic metabolite to be cleared and prevent further buildup. Right, so we take off the bloods and we prescribe the Papernex and diazepam as per Siwa. We ask the nurse to send off the urine sample and then we get the bloods back. Take a minute now to go over them. So the FBC, the full blood count, is unremarkable, as are the Eusenes, apart from a mildly lowered sodium level. Looking at the LFTs, we can see that the toxic metabolite has indeed caused some liver damage, with ALT and AST raised. The GGT is raised likely as a consequence of Gemma's drinking. In acute liver failure, the ALT and the AST would be raised in the thousands. The liver damage has not resulted in any clotting abnormalities at this point, as evidenced by a normal prothrombin time and international normalised ratio. Finally, we can see that the paracetamol level is 110 mg per litre. Now we know these bloods were taken at 3 o'clock in the morning, and that Gemma took the paracetamol around 6 o'clock, so that's 9 hours ago. Using this information, we can plot this on the paracetamol nomogram to assess whether Gemma will require N-acetylcysteine, and indeed doing this demonstrates that she does. I appreciate here that the graph line only starts from beyond four hours, reflecting what I mentioned earlier. It should be pointed out that there are a few exceptions to the rule of only prescribing N-acetylcysteine four hours from the onset of ingestion, to rather than give it straight away, and this is when there is doubt with regards to the timing of when the paracetamol is taken. If it's been a staggered overdose, in other words, an overdose in which paracetamol has been taken two or more times apart with greater than an hour's interval in between, and if there's been greater than 150 milligrams per kilogram of paracetamol taken. Imagine Gemma's weight is, say, 60 kilograms, so she would have to consume more than 9 grams for the N-acetylcysteine to be indicated. We know she's taken up to a box of paracetamol, and a standard box of paracetamol contains 16 500 milligram tablets. This means she's taken up to 8 grams worth of paracetamol, so still she would not qualify for immediate N-acetylcysteine treatment. So we prescribe N-acetylcysteine for Gemma, the initial dose being an infusion, given over an hour in a bag of either 5% dextrose or 0.9% saline. A further three doses of n acetylcysteine are then usually given subsequently to give a full 24 hours worth of treatment. Okay, so Gemma's now receiving her n acetylcysteine so we now have to think about referring her to a suitable ward, ideally the toxicology department or the general medical ward. So let's have a go at that, presenting Gemma's case to the medical registrar for toxicology. Use the SBAR format of situation, background, assessment and response to do this. How did that go? Well, here is an example of what the referral might sound like. Hi, it's the Med Reg on call. Oh, hi there. Thanks for getting back to me. Uh, I'm Ross McKean, one of the junior doctors in the admitting ward. I was wondering if I could just discuss a patient with you. Go ahead. Great, thanks. Uh, so it's a 19-year-old girl called Gemma McKenzie. Uh, she's been admitted this evening having taken an intentional overdose of paracetamol. She took roughly 8 grams of paracetamol whilst intoxicated after a fight with her boyfriend, and this was roughly 9 hours ago. She complains of abdominal pain and nausea and is currently still intoxicated but otherwise feels fine. She has a history of physical self-harm but is normally fit and well. On assessment, she looks well. She is tachycardic and slightly tremulous, which I'm gathering is a result of her alcohol use. All other vital signs are fine. Uh, on examination, she has a slightly tender right upper quadrant, but there is no guarding and bowel sounds are present. Having taken her bloods, I note she has a paracetamol level of 110 and should therefore be treated with N-acetylcysteine as per the paracetamol normogram. Her ALT is raised at 179, 
uh, but I'm not concerned with her plotting at this stage. Uh, given this diagnosis of paracetamol overdose, I've commenced her on NAC. I've also commenced Pavernex and Diazepam as per Siwa, given her history. From here, I think the most appropriate place for her to be is the toxicology ward to monitor her bloods and for completing treatment. Is there anything else you want to know at this stage? No, that's fine, thanks. Uh, I'll come down and see her just now, but yes, I agree that the toxicology ward sounds like the most suitable place for her. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. Once Gemma has got to the end of this 24-hour period, we should check that the serum paracetamol level is zero and ensure that the ALT, creatinine and INR have normalised, otherwise continue with treatment. Provided that all this is normal, Gemma can then safely be discharged home. But let's consider if this wasn't the case. What if Gemma had presented a day later with fulminant hepatic failure? Then the prognosis would be far worse, and the N-acetylcysteine is far less effective as hepatic necrosis has occurred. Acute liver failure, what is it? Well, it is the loss of hepatocellular function that leads to a complex variety of systemic complications. There are several causes. The most important ones for you to remember are paracetamol overdose, as described here, alcohol and viral hepatitis, A and B being the most common. In Western countries, paracetamol has surpassed viral hepatitis as the leading cause of acute liver failure, owing to it being readily available and cheap to purchase. Limitations have been put in place, however, in more recent years to limit how much can be bought at one time. Hepatitis B remains the leading cause of acute liver failure worldwide. We've already gone through the features of acute liver failure through Gemma's case, both the signs and symptoms and investigations of this process, so I won't repeat this here. The management of established acute liver failure is more complex than just N-acetylcysteine, and indeed the role of N-acetylcysteine here is pretty limited. The patient will likely require management in an ICU setting, and it's vital that the liver transplant team are involved at an early stage. The factors that would prompt the need for liver transplantation in the context of paracetamol overdose can be remembered with the mnemonic HARM. This stands for hepatic encephalopathy, grades 3 or 4, acute renal failure with a creatinine greater than 3000, a rising prothrombin time greater than 100 seconds, and metabolic acidosis where the pH is less than 7.3, 24 hours post-ingestion of the overdose. That completes this video, exploring some of the points related to the management of paracetamol overdose and the features of acute liver failure that may arise as a result of it. We've looked at the pertinent points to ask about when taking a history, what signs, or lack thereof, you might elicit on physical examination, what investigations would be considered, and how the patient should be treated.